Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And good evening to everyone watching us online in our live stream. Good to have you. And good evening to a very special guest, the president of the German Patent and Trademark Office, Cordula Rudolf Schäfer. Thank you for being here tonight. Now, yes. Welcome to the Siemens Inventors of the Year Awards 2018. My name is Martin Kloss, and I'm excited to be part of this wonderful event, this wonderful evening. Now, for 23 years, Siemens has been hosting this Inventors of the Year Award, and they have been celebrating the achievements of researchers and developments from around the world. And besides celebrating the achievements of people tonight, we also want to give you an evening of inspiration for you to take away new ideas, new perspectives. We will honor what people have created, motivated by purpose and realized by collaboration. And we will give the awards to honor what they have created. But in order to understand the innovations, we also need to look at the why and the how. And in the spirit of honoring great innovations, this year we're partnering with TEDx München. And for those of you who do not know what TED is or have never watched a TED talk on YouTube, TED is a nonprofit organization specializing, devoted to spreading ideas, usually in the form of short and very powerful talks. And the independently run TEDx spread ideas on a local level for local communities around the world. And this year's TEDx München took place just two, two days ago on Sunday, right around the corner at the famous Kammerspiele. And it was supported by Siemens. So again, it was a collaboration. And to give you an impression of this event, we asked the TEDx speakers about our topics for tonight, collaboration and purpose. Let's see what they had to say. It's very important to have a purpose in life. Mine is to make a difference. My purpose in life is to serve a kind of social change that starts from the inside outwards. My purpose is to explore, experience and create. I think staying curious and exploring myself and the world. What is the part that's just fantasy, and where does that leave reality? I love spreading ideas around the world, but I cannot do it alone. And of course, I can't do it alone either. So please, ladies and gentlemen, give a huge round of applause to the host of this evening, the Siemens Chief Operating Officer, the CTO and member of the Managing Board, Roland Busch. <laughs> Welcome, Thank Roland. You. Well, tonight we're here to <coughs> celebrate the achievements of some of the inventors who work at Siemens. And um, as I guess we all know, Siemens was founded by an inventor, Werner von Siemens, over 170 years ago. And today there are over 370,000 <coughs> people working for Siemens in over 200 <coughs> countries. So, in your experience, what role do the employees play in innovation? Everything. I think it is about people, and it's not about the individuals only. 
I think the times where the inventor was sitting in a closed room and they were inventing all day long and they came out with a great idea. Um, still, we have some, I guess. But it's, it's over. It's more collaborative work. It's more interdisciplinary work. And, um, and also, in the way how we are playing diversity um, in, in any kind of dimension. And this blend, I guess, makes really the difference. Like you just said, I mean, we have lots of inventors, a lot of smart people. They invent things all the time in their little room. But how do they go on to make that into a successful company or turn it into a successful invention? What is the yeah, I, I always differentiate between invention and innovation. So an invention becomes an innovation not before it's tested in the market successfully and not before you really make profitable revenue out of it. So that's really then when an invention is hitting the market and it's getting an innovation. And that's something what, what people often also forget. Um, you see that also in the startup scene that you know, people come with a great idea and this is only one part of it. If it doesn't make it way, its way to the market, if not the business model is not behind, if you don't know how to monetize it, that's only half of it. And sometimes uh, great ideas die if you don't have this combination. So you have a lot of great individuals, a lot of great inventors, smart people, but as a company with that long history and tradition, how do you stay innovative as a company? Um, that's a good question, I guess, um, and it's like market share. Every day we have to fight for our market share. You start basically at zero and you have to fight for it. And we have to, I mean, there's a lot of elements which coming together. Number one is we have to stay tuned to the technology change. And, and the whole thing about automation and digitalization or electrification as well is really changing the world very fast, digitalization in particular. So we really have to stay tuned um, in order not to miss the boat here. The other point is creating an environment where people come and they, they want to join us and they, uh, they get all this, all this history of, of having a company which ever since we were founded, we were, we were on technology and innovations, we investing money into it. Investing is another element. If you don't feed the engine, nothing comes out. Uh, but then, then also we have to stay focused. This is another element that you, even if you spend 5.6 billion um, in R&D, uh, it's not, to, not enough to really cover all the fields. So this brings me to the other element, which is our ecosystem, universities and partners. So if you bring this all together, and this is a unique setup, which you find only at Siemens, it's our ecosystem, it's unique per definition, and our people, then we really can show that we are staying tuned and hopefully we are as innovative or maybe more innovative than we are today. Thank you for now. We'll talk a little bit more in a bit. Uh, thank you, Roland, for now. Thanks. That's the question, right? How do we innovate? How do we come up with great ideas? And then, how do we make them happen? The history of the human race is a history of collaboration. Truly great things only happen when we work together. Have you ever seen a great movie? Or listened to an orchestra play a wonderful symphony? Filmmaking is a miracle of collaboration, as is an orchestra. And the best innovations happen through collaboration by bringing together different ideas, skills, experiences, cultures, and combining our unique talents with others will enable us to go beyond what we thought was possible. Now, before we talk about what Siemens does to foster collaboration, let's get another perspective first. He is a leading international authority on innovation and creativity. As an author and advisor to businesses and governments around the globe, he specializes in innovation strategies and the role of collaboration. He says that not consumption or production, but participation is the key organizing idea for the future society. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charles Sleetbeater. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for that introduction, and to Dr. Bush, and to Siemens for having me here. I, I should say something about myself just a little bit before I start. I have spent 25 years as a member of a kind of cult 
Um, worldwide cult, thousands of people have joined me in this cult, and we followed a charismatic leader who, even when he did things which were dreadfully wrong, uh, we couldn't do uh, anything about. And so uh, I'm an Arsenal season ticket holder, so coming to Munich for me is to revisit deep trauma. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I'm hoping that tonight is going to be a bit better than that. Uh, and the second thing to say is, obviously, uh, I come from Britain. don't know if you've heard of Britain. Uh, it's a small place on the edge of Europe which is drifting out into the Atlantic. Um, so we're in the middle of this process called Brexit, which is the longest suicide note in history. Um, <laughs> And we've just had the, the terms of the Brexit, the initial terms of the Brexit kind of, you know, treaty, agreement, so on and so forth. Very complicated. So, thankfully, the government have issued some guidelines on what we are expected to dress like in future. Here they are. I can show you a picture. There. So that, that's what the British are going to dress like in future, just so that they're absolutely sure that the people they're talking to are also British. The German poet Heinrich Heine was once asked where he would like to die, and he said he'd like to die in England, because everything in England happens a hundred years later than <laughs> everywhere else. So, um, so I have no idea why you have invited someone who's British to come and talk to you about the future. But what I'm going to tell you about is just I'm going to tell you one story about someone who really ha did change the world uh, and how he did it. I'm going to give you four lessons that I think stand out from that story. And I'll just show you a picture of who this guy is. I don't know if anyone knows who this is. Does anyone have any idea. So this is not Steve Jobs, it's not Bill Gates, it's not Andy Gove. This guy is called Malcolm McLean. And Malcolm McLean changed every life in this room. It will have affected every life, what he did. Malcolm McLean was a trucker, and his roots were up the east coast of America in the mid-1950s, as the American economy was booming after the Second World War, and McLean had some problems. The roads were too narrow, they got congested, the trucks get, kept getting stuck. His drivers, heavily unionized, Teamsters, he had to pay them overtime, so he got very frustrated with all the delays and so on and so forth. So he wondered what alternative solutions would be, and I suppose before his time he engaged in what would be called out-of-the-box thinking. And so he thought, oh, what I'll do is I'll drive my lorries onto a ship and I'll sail the ship up to New York and then I'll drive them off again. So he put his lorries on a ship and when they got out to sea, the ship almost sank because the lorries started moving around. Gratefully, he made it back to port, saved the ship and the lorries and himself, and he decided he had to think again. He'd heard about a guy in Alaska who, because of the extreme conditions in Alaska, had built these metal boxes. And he put the stuff that they were shipping in the boxes, and he thought, that sounds like a good idea. So he got this guy from Alaska, and in McLean's backyard, they built the first containers. And in 1956, they sailed this ship, the Ideal X, up the coast of America, can t carrying, as you can see, a relatively small number of containers. This was the first container ship to sail. And it did not emerge from some huge R&D lab. The Ideal X was a World War II tanker that McLean reconditioned, and he put the containers on the top like that and he got two disused cranes at either end to lift them off. So it was very um, do-it-yourself, if you like, this innovation. But two things were evident right from that moment. The first was he got round the traffic jams. 
But the second was, this was much more efficient than traditional ways of carrying freight, because carrying freight involved sacks and crates and barrels and other things that had to be loaded into the hold of a ship. That was very time-consuming. Uh, lots of things got broken. The ship stayed in port for a long time to allow that process to happen. Uh, and this, the container, even on this first voyage, was already 80% cheaper than the traditional way of doing it. So 1956, he sails this boat, amazing invention. What happens then? It's like the storming of the Bastille, the start of the revolution. Absolutely nothing happens. No one is in the slightest bit interested in these containers. So for the first 15 years of its life, the container kind of goes like this. Few people experiment with it, but they basically, they add the container to the traditional way of doing freight. Then, in the 1970s, when new patterns of trade open up, longer routes, carrying finished goods, different kinds of manufacturing processes from Japan, a whole new wave of people come into the industry, and they systematize it. And they turn what was a product into a system. The container is a product. Containerization is the system, and it's the system that then propelled these huge advances in productivity and cutting costs and transformed the world. The reduction of po in poverty in the third world, the developing world, was largely driven by this innovation to allow trade in manufactured products. The growth of consumerism in the 70s and 80s was fueled by this. It was an epochal change, all created by this simple box. So what are the lessons of Maclean's innovation? If you want to change the world as comprehensively and systematically as he did? Well, the first is, you have to make it simple. It's a box. It's not complicated. The best innovations take complexity out, especially for consumers. They hide complexity or reduce complexity. The matchbox is simple, the screw cap is simple, the zip is simple, the Apple iPhone is simple, because they've been designed to take the complexity out. That happens when you start seeing an innovation from the point of view of the users, not the inventors. Often the inventors like to put stuff in because it makes it technically more interesting. Actually, what you've got to do usually is hand it over to people who will take the complexity out for the sake of the consumer. The other thing that makes things simple is not just user design, it's a system, an end-to-end -end solution. And so the big, second big message of Malcolm McLean is systems beat products. When the container started, it was a product within an old system. It's a bit like the electric car now is a kind of product within an old combustion engine system. Actually, the big change will come when you get completely different kinds of automated transport systems. That's the real promise, a system, not a product. So it's containerization that's the revolution, not the container. And systems develop when people create entirely new ways of bringing together products, services, software, infrastructure, behavior, regulation. In other words, you have to bring lots of people together. Ten years ago, if you had wanted to get the best digital e-book reader, you would have got a Sony e-book reader, which had a brilliant screen and great battery and fantastic functionality. It was beaten by the scrappy, rather ugly Kindle, because the Kindle was a system of publishers and books and downloads, which made life incredibly simple for consumers. So think system, not just product. And that means you can't go it alone. Unless you've got all of the complementary assets you need to make your product a real success, you need allies. And my experience of innovation is that innovation often starts with visionaries and prophets in the wilderness and people who are a little bit mad, 
but it becomes essentially about teams, collaboration, communities, alliances, coalitions, and big social movements. And if we want to turn electric mobility or the circular economy or recycling water into a big change, it has to become more like a movement than simply an invention. So you need to be good at building those alliances. And you need to think that you're part of some big change. The only successful things I have ever done, and I haven't done many, have come about because you have an idea at the right time with the right person and you hit a wave of social change. I've had lots of ideas that have been slightly too early or haven't found the right person, but this sense that you're expressing a bigger aspiration, you're part of a bigger change in society, and you're looking outward to be part of that change, understanding how people want to live in new kinds of ways, that's really important. You will only be big if you're part of a much bigger change. And that means you have to have a sense of generosity about what you're doing. I think there's no better time, no more urgent time now than to innovate in radical ways. And that's because many of the systems that we currently rely upon are breaking down. Finance systems, energy systems, systems that we invented in the 20th and 19th century which are no longer fit. And what we've got to do is go from breakdown to breakthrough. We've got to break through to new ways of doing things. And that is going to come from people who are prepared to ask radical questions. And the most radical question is not what you can add, it's what you can take away. It's what you can do without. Because what we need are cities without combustion engines. We need energy without carbon. We need packaging without plastic. Probably we need money without banks. And there are a whole set of other things that technology is going to make possible where you can take lots of things out. Take out the waste of resources, talent, and capability that current systems take for granted. There's no better time of, for thinking big. Keep it simple. Think system, not product. Don't go it alone. Be part of a bigger change. Then you have a chance of really changing the world. Thank you. Stay with us. And please, please have a seat. And let me ask uh, Holland to come join us on the stage. Thank you very much, Charles. Holland, have a seat, please. Thank you for these insights. And uh, let's talk a little bit about this. Now, Holland, the company filed 7,300 patents this year. That's 33 inventions per workday. Amazing. I mean, the company already holds 65,000 patents worldwide, has over 43,000 R&D employees. Really impressive numbers. In other words, you know, a big company, lots of people, lots of great ideas. So, honestly, why is it important for Siemens to collaborate with other organizations? Yeah, I mean, if you look about the money which goes into the fields which we are covering, it's still very, very small numbers. And there are still out companies out there who do have more spendings in R&D, even though 5.6 billion is a big number. But, uh, but if you think about the, the, the broad the range what Siemens is covering in the, in the energy sector, is it healthcare sector, is it building technologies, is it industry? So um, actually we could easily spend twice as much and we would not catch it. So this is the reason why we still have to rely on a very strong ecosystem and we want to engage others. I mean, you're completely right. Um, you, you have to join forces and do something together. And you just said it, don't go at it alone, Charles. You, would you agree with that statement that inventions usually involve a long line of different contributions from many other people? Yes, I think there are some inventions which are genuinely disruptive and genuinely new, but most of the time it's a cumulative process which draws on a sense of, I suppose, a community or a tradition of knowledge, but takes a new twist on it. And so I think the, 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 the challenge is to be 
part of a tradition of knowledge and a community, but also to be enough outside it that you can critique it, challenge it, and add something different. And finding people who can play that kind of trade-off, I suppose, is part of what is about building innovation in a big company like Siemens. I mean, we hear a lot about innovation these days in the media. When we talk about innovation, we usually talk about uh, new startups, small, very agile companies. So, Roland, how does a massive company like Siemens foster collaboration both within but also without, outside the company? And do you think your size is actually a disadvantage um, because you're not as agile? Why would young startups want to collaborate with a company like Siemens? Yeah, we, uh, we want to make the size an advantage, I have to say. So, I mean, how we are collaborating? We are, of course, we have our relationship with universities and institutions. Um, which is which is also over, grown over many many years. So we really do have insights. We have very strong partners there, and then of course we are looking into the venture capital space. Uh, we are looking into startups, and for startups we we have actually um, of course it's about money which we're going to spend. But money you can get from different venture capital companies too. Um, we want to make Siemens small to these companies in order to really guide the way. That's what we call catalyst. So we would provide them uh, support in how they go to customers. I mean, Siemens can literally open the door to every kind of CEO they want to see, wherever in the world. We are active in 200 companies, countries in the world. But also to make them, give them access to our engineering resources and to really see what we can do together. That's an advantage. And the other point is, it's about create. We are, we are looking also into having our own accelerator where we get people from Siemens and give them an, a chance to really work full time on their idea, but also give them guidance. So it's not about an idea, it's about the whole, the whole way how to, how to monetize, how to create a system out of it, and that's what we do too. So I think it's a, it's a nice combination, and, uh, and that, I think, is, is really helping us going above and beyond our own core research and engineering. And we are in the age of digitization and digital technologies. And in your opinion, how do they impact this innovation process and also the collaboration? How have digitization and, and the digital transformation really changed the nature of collaboration for you as a company? Uh, digitalization, I guess, is, is changing in the whole way how we innovate in, in many, many dimensions. One is it breaks down silos. We see that. Um, and uh, if you look about mobility, it will, be, it will be shared, it will be electric, it will be connected, it will be autonomous. Everything has to do with, with digitalization one way or the other. And this, this really then cuts the silos between the energy sector and the mobility sector. Um, this is one dimension. Another one is, is speed. Um, there's so many innovations. And I like your container example. Maybe you can talk about this one. I mean, you know that the cloud technology is also about containerizing, or the, having containers in the mm. software to deploy. And it's, it's more than a product, it's a system. And this mm. really accelerates the speed with which you develop software. I mean, it's, it's, mm. it's traumatic, which, which makes a difference. So, and, um, and so therefore, there are a lot of, of elements coming together, which, um, which um, digitalization finally drives. One last thing, um, when we talk about innovation, um, we have in the past a lot of, we call it in vitro, innovation, so you really test something in the field, material science. Now we make it in silicon, that means we simulate, you have a digital twin. So we can simulate many, many things before we really go into mm. a sample. And this is so powerful and mm. can reduce time so fast. So mm. and that's another way, how, and it changes the work completely. Mm. Let me pick up on that. From your outside perspective, Charles, uh, how have digitization and digital technologies changed innovation? Well, I think there's been, I'm going to be a bit sort of um, unkind here, because I think there's been an enormous amount of kind of, you know, I think sharing pictures and messages and all of that is important stuff and so on and so forth. But I think we haven't really got to the meat of it yet. And I think the meat of it is solving big challenges. It's about energy, food, waste, all of these things. And that's where I think actually, I hope in a way, the kind of pendulum will swing back away from a sort of reliance on Silicon Valley venture models to realize that actually 
purpose-driven innovation, which is about creating new urban systems, which right. is what we need, um, they're not going to be invented by apps alone. They're about a whole combination of different kinds of knowledge. So I think that, that, I think, that swing back to purpose, to big challenges, really matters. And I think that what Dr. Bush is talking about is this new relationship between the digital and the physical, which would be really critical that instead of the digital just being up here in a digital world, it's enabling us to reconfigure the physical to make it more efficient, more energy conscious, and that interaction of the digital and the physical will become yes. more intense, more creative, which means the knowledge that's involved in people who are in mechatronics and bionics and what have you becomes even more important. So as a conclusion, please, a question to the both of you. From your perspective, what would you say are the top three ingredients for a successful innovation? Maybe you go first, Charles. Well, I, I would say first challenge. Challenge the status quo. Set yourself a big challenge. It's got to sort of be difficult. Um, conversation. I think all the best innovation comes through conversation. If there's one tip I would have, it's have lunch. I mean, don't have lunch. In other words, well, the thing I hate about American companies is people having lunch in cubicles. Uh, actually have lunch, have a conversation. And the other is commitment. I mean, you can have an idea like that, but turning an idea into a product and a business and a system, that takes real commitment. So challenge, conversation, commitment. Roman, what do you think? I, I would add, and, and just add to this one, um, customer value. I think the, the customer orientation, market orientation is for me the first point where you would start. The second one is, I, I just echo what you said and you described it very well, it's the, the, the really the interaction between the, the real world and the digital world. Um, if you play that right, um, this opens a complete new um, dimension of, of the way how we innovate. And, and the third one is people. Um, people who are constantly learning and who are going to train on new technologies, uh, lifelong learning, faster learning. So if we bring this together, I think it's a, it's a good mixture. I think a little bit of money is necessary too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great closing statement. I mean, tonight is all about the people. So thank you very much for your insights, for sharing your perspectives. Charles Liebbitter, Roland Bush, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, let's get to our award ceremony. Tonight, we will honor 12 researchers from nine different countries on four continents. And together, these 12 scientists are responsible for some 590 inventions and 589 individual patents. Amazing. So let's give them a big round of applause first. And we'll start with our first category, open innovation. And creating open innovations can be defined as an innovation process that flows across organizational borders. In Francis Ford Coppola's film, The Godfather, Don Corleone said, never tell anybody outside the company what you're thinking again. Sorry for that, uh, Brando impression. But telling others what you're thinking should actually be part of the open innovation process. That's the point. And the inventors in this category not only look beyond the boundaries, they go even further by constantly changing their perspective. And they're not part of Siemens. They are representatives of universities or startups who have worked closely together with Siemens and thus personify Siemens's open innovation strategy. And to present the award in the open innovation category, please welcome Siemens Managing Board member and chairman of the supervisory board of Siemens Health Engineers, Michael Sen. Hi there, good evening. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a very warm welcome also 
from my side, now we're getting to the real part where it's all about people, about the real cases, showcases, uh, because they really made a difference. And uh, tonight, we honor inventors who are relevant. It's exactly what we have just heard. In order to be relevant, you have to tackle a real issue. And one topic, if I may add, next to energy, waste, and everything, is obviously health and healthcare, a very, very important topic also with a big, big societal need. And I'm really honored to kick it off and to start off this category. And uh, today, we, we just heard it, many people talk about the ecosystem and collaboration. Well, at healthcare and Siemens Healthcare, this is actually one of the sources and ingredient of our sustained success, especially in the imaging arena, because long before the name collaboration made it through all the virtual networks, we have had strong ties, and we call them actually part of Siemens, because they are part of our network. We even have collaboration managers in our organization. And the approach I want to you know, open up today is a really, really interesting one. And I would like to introduce Peter Jakob, I would say, pronounce it deliberately in German because he's a professor of experimental physics at the University of Würzburg, and Mark, Mark Griswold, a professor also very well known at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And this is about a very, very smart part of innovation because it's actually also combining the physical and the real world. They are very engaged in MRI technology, magnetic resonance imaging. And I really liked the name which they found for their invention because it's called Kaipirinia. <laughs> and uh, I asked them what is so special about Kaipirinia, and they said Kaipirinia makes it much faster and much sharper if you look at the MRI scan. So I'm not so sure whether it's sharper because you had the drink before, <laughs> but uh, actually, it is um, about the system-wide challenge, and the healthcare system is under scrutiny, and we talk about value-based healthcare, which means to have better outcomes, better clinical outcomes, at lower cost. In short, we could call it more for less, and this is exactly what you do, because when you have to undergo an MRI scan with the help of your solution, we can skip certain steps in the scanning process, and those gaps are filled with a software algorithm. The data is uh, retrieved from algorithms, and so we still get better pictures, and ultimately, it also is to the benefit of the patient. Ultimately, we talk about, Roland said it, don't forget the customer, right? In this case, it's a patient, patient's comfort, patient's safety, because some of you who may have had an MRI scan, you know it, hold your breath for two minutes and then the scan goes boom, 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 boom. This shortens the time where you may have to hold your breath. You get better, better image resolutions and that, again, helps the physician to make a better clinical decision and leads to better outcomes. So I'm almost tempted to say, let's raise our glass to Kaipirinia. Please welcome on stage and with a big round of applause, Peter and Mark. Now, hand over the awards, would you be so kind? Yeah, thank you. So, congratulations, thank you. Yes, give out. Mark, congratulations, thanks.
Peter is going to stand like so, that. So, congratulations, guys. Let me ask you, in your opinion, what is the benefit of open collaboration for both of you? Who wants to answer? Um, so, so, first off, thank you to Siemens. Uh, so, Peter and I have worked with uh, Siemens for uh, probably over 20 years at this point. And I think that uh, we see the benefit on both sides. I think that Siemens, a big company like Siemens, gets to experiment in areas that are probably too risky for such a large company to do. Um, and we get to supply those things back to Siemens. What's important to us is actually getting our inventions into to act, treat actual patients. And for that, we need a company the, the size of Siemens to actually get it out into the marketplace. And, I think that's been really successful. We have some of our things that we've done together treat um, something like 100,000 patients a day. And wow. so that's the, the, the only way that we can do that is through partnership with Siemens. So we, we think we both win and it's, it's really exciting to see where we're gonna go next. Yeah, where well, are you gonna go next? What's the next cocktail? Which cocktail are you working on next after Caipirinha? <laughs> I mean, um, first of all, this has a long tradition in our group, so we start with something like pills, very simple. Then we had grappa, <laughs> then we had uh, caipirinha, and finally Mark came up with absinthe. And you know, <laughs> absinthe is kind of the hardest alcohol you can drink. And then we just gave up on uh, further, how should I say, uh, acronyms on, on, on alcoholic beverages, but we meanwhile use other ones like yeah, my, Mark is doing these days MR fingerprinting. We are working on a race and stuff like that. But it's all, always important for an inventor to have an acronym where you can identify yourself with that. Yeah. We'll certainly remember that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Congratulations once again. And all the best for your future endeavors. Thank you. And by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, this beautiful award was created by the artist Buku, a sculptor from Berlin. It's called Portal, and it was inspired by the elements of creativity and analysis um, in a very dynamic dialogue. So very, very interesting sculpture. Let's get to our next category, outstanding invention. Our world today is moving faster than ever before. And it is also never going to move as slowly as it is today. And in this diverse and fast-paced world, innovations seem to happen almost every day. And we define an innovation simply as maybe a new idea, a device, or a method for something. But what makes it outstanding? This category honors game changers with an exceptional invention who have set standards in their, uh, in their particular technological area of expertise. And we award a technically significant invention or an improvement of an existing product, a new approach which helped solve a social problem or improve living conditions. And to present the award for outstanding invention, please welcome the CEO, power and guest, Willy Meixner. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be amongst so many curious and uncommitted people this evening. Harvesting energy sources like offshore wind and oil and gas is a high investment, complex, and very often dangerous undertaking. Tonight, we celebrate an invention from Vermont Karstadt, from our division Process Industry and Drives, which has made offshore rig operations a lot safer and a lot more economic than they used to be. Check-up check -up rigs are these big constructions which are used to construct offshore wind farms and land, oil and gas production equipment. These giant platforms have three to four legs up to 200 meters long, and it takes over 90 motors to anchor them on the ground of the sea. In the past, installation was a high-risk operation. If you look on check-up rigs on YouTube, you can see some of these impressive and scary videos what could have happened in the old days. Today, this loss of 
multi-million investments and the risk to life of people is a tale of the past. Wehmund took on the task to technically master this challenge together with his customer, Gusto MSC, a Dutch construction company. He developed a variable speed drive which made the installation of these, these platforms a lot slower, a lot more controllable, and a, and a lot safer. Sometimes speed in life is not everything. Several, several major underwater oil and gas production companies have already applied his invention. So Roland, it has really moved from an invention to a true innovation, and I'm sure there will be more customers out there to take on this very innovative product. Wemund Karstadt lives and works in Norway, a country which is renowned to be at the forefront of this offshore technology. Your invention is another landmark in this evolution of technology made by Siemens, made in Norway. Let's welcome Wemund Karstadt on the stage. And we will first uh, watch that little video. Yeah. <laughs> And now, please give a big applause to Vemon Kastad. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Well deserved. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Would you like to? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, congratulations again. And once again, you can give him some applause. Thank you. Well, come, come closer together, come join me here a little bit. Yes. And then, so we have a nice picture of the two of you. All right. Thank you. So, Raymond, yeah. how did you hear about this major rig problem? What motivated you to actually find a solution for this? Yeah, it's on. It's on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, the motivation is, of course, uh, curiosity. And um, we learned, I would say, the late 90s, uh, the last century, that um, ship owners, uh, rig operators, and naval designers uh, had some issues which we would like to, let us say, improve a little bit. And um, um, that, that, of course, took some time. Um, we are doing solution business. And in solution, it's multidisciplinary technologies and also um, interest involved. So we had then to spend some time in, uh, in dialogue with our colleagues, good colleagues in, uh, in Holland that had some excellent, again, contacts with, as was mentioned here, uh, Gusto MSC. Um, from that point of, I think we got a reasonable result and uh, I think the interest then from oil companies and also the wind installation companies later on has, uh, has pr given some proof of the idea. And tonight we're talking about collaboration and you just mentioned you have this cooperation with Gusto MSC. So how important was that for you? Uh, that is really Im important because in solution business it is about multidisciplinary um, um, interests. And uh, Siemens as a company has, of course, a lot of various competences. But um, in terms of the naval experiences and also the uh, marine um, part of it, I think uh, we can add some additional from outside of Siemens. So a win-win situation. Definitely a win-win situation, yes. Thank you very much. Once again, congratulations. And this is your applause. <laughs> Thank you again. The best inventions, as we learned, happen through, through teamwork, as impressively shown 
by our next couple of, of outstanding innovators. One of the hot challenges we are facing in, in our division in, in power and gas is to increase the efficiency of traditional fossil power generation. This involves further raising the, the temperatures we are using to run the combustion system and the turbines. Wernerstamm and Arturo Flores and Terria have been developing a new way to create a thermal insulation coating for turbine blades. And if you wonder what thermal insulation coating is, as we as human beings need coating to be protected from the cold, uh, gas turbine material needs coating to be protected from the, from the sheer heat. And in this case, we talk really hot. We talk 1,200 degrees Celsius and, and above. Today, these new coatings can be simulated on a, a computer program prior to applying them for a lengthy test procedure, allowing us to be a lot faster in bringing new technologies into, into the market. They invented, over the last couple of years, a new way of metal bond coating called SC, Siemens Coating 2479, which is the backbone today of our technology of gas turbines reaching world-class efficiencies of 60% and above. The latest coating composition contains elements like, can I need to read now, erbium and ederbium. Some of you may remember them from your chemical studies. And uh, we are confident that, that these elements and, and the applications will pave us the way of our latest technology of gas turbines up to 62% and 64% of, of efficiency. And to put that for all of us into perspective, one percentage point in efficiency is valued by our customers by around 30 million in a number of markets of euro, equivalent to 1.5 times of the equipment he's, he's buying. Let's look now at the video before we welcome them on stage. Dr. Wetterstam and Dr. Tyrell Flores Renteria. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, so give them some applause. It makes it easier to receive the award. Thank you. There's one more. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, switch them around. Yeah. 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 OK, thank you. Come over a little bit for the picture. Like just the three of you. I like that power post that you just did in the video. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me just uh, get that microphone. Thank you. So now the two of you have very different backgrounds, an excellent uh, example for collaboration. Now, Arturo, how did you convince Vanna to take you on board? <laughs> It's a very good question. Uh, when I joined Siemens, uh, I was supposed, I mean, I was joined to, to, to help Werner with his projects. And um, regarding collaboration, we got to good along between the two of us. Uh, maybe based on our cultures, I'm Mexican, he's German. And we um, um, handled to get over our culture and uh, maybe laugh a little bit about the cliches of our cultures, but we have a very good collaboration. He's a physicist, he knows the movement of the spins of the atoms. I'm a mechanical engineer with material science PhD. And um, since I am the newer also, I am able to bring new ideas. Then I asked Werner, according to his experience in this, his knowledge in physicists, and she says, oh yeah, that sounds good, let's try that one. Well. <laughs> and that's the way uh, the, our inventions uh, came to life. Very good to hear. Now, Vena, this is actually the second time that you have won this award. Tell me, what kept you going and what makes you both so successful and work together? Uh, oh, this is a long... 
It's on. You can, <laughs> it's a long story. I, let me say I started with physics. Okay, and during, let me say, semester holidays, I went to the semester courses, Hülich Research Center. When I finished this uh, PhD, I didn't went into materials. I developed the filter systems for the clean room of uh, uh, Dresden. That was a completely different task. Then I went to Siemens. And what I did is I go into the factory, I look what they did, and uh, from my experience, I have also uh, a craft as a fine mechanics. It was uh, very interesting for me. But that makes not the inventor. The inventor makes what you discussed before, <laughs> said before, said before, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> said before, as the inventor makes, you have to discuss with people. What I did is I have uh, bachelor guys. I have this, I've done 12 bachelor theses this year. And uh, uh, please an applause for my wife, that, sh that she's still with me. <laughs> 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 and for all wives of the inventors, because there is a strong time, because we did all the work more or less at the weekend. And on the other side, I have a network with the so-called FEV, that is the research center in in Darmstadt and so on, and that is my network. It is a large network, and based on my knowledge and this large, large network and the discussion, that makes an invention. Thank you very much, and I hope you, I hope you keep going. Oh, thank you. And I, we'll yeah, see you here in a third time. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay, congratulations once again. Thank you, Vanna. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you. See you later. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, thank you, Willy Meixer. Now, for the next award in the category of Outstanding Invention, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage the laudatory, the CEO of Siemens Mobility, Sabrina Susson. Hello, 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 can you hear me? Oh. I lost the connection. We all know how frustrating it is when we are in the middle of an important phone call and we lose the connection because there is no coverage. And it's even more frustrating when a teenager is sitting close to you on a train, loses connection, and is even more frustrating. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored today to be here and to honor our inventors of the year. Today we expect to be able to work everywhere and to be connected everywhere, especially on trains. And we know, unfortunately, that the coverage and the connection in the trains are not always perfect. I would not say they are not so good, but they are not always perfect. <laughs> Luckily, Today, our third winners in the Outstanding Invention category, Andreas Demmer, Lukas Meyer, and Merdat Majidi, have come up with an ingenious solution to solve this problem, which is our problem to all of us. The reason why mobile phone reception is not so reliable in the train is because the radio waves are reflected by the windows, and your mobile waves cannot go out of the train with full strength. Lucas, Andreas, and Merdat came up with a very ingenious idea of a laser cutting a geometrical pattern in the metallic layer of the window coating. And this allows the waves to go out with a full strength. And this allows us to be more happy. <laughs> The conventional approach to this problem would be to install radio ampl amplifiers, but this solution would be much more expensive, of course, and would need more maintenance because you would have to change these amplifiers every few years. And in this case, it's a low-cost solution, the customer is happy, and the passenger is even more happy because his experience on the trains can be 
great because it's always connected. Soon, the passengers traveling on our train, the Rheinruhr Express, will be able to um, benefit from this experience and to be always connected and have an improved cell phone connection. So I will have to take the train and then I, can, I will be able to make all my phone calls in a, yeah, in a happy situation. We have signed other contracts in Austria and Czech Republic, uh, and the train operators will implement this great invention. This invention is another result of a great teamwork, a teamwork between Siemens Mobility and corporate technology in Austria. And last but not least, let me add my daughter, she's a teenager, she will love this invention. <laughs> So now we will watch the video. Welcome on Big stage, Andreas, Lucas, and Merdat. So before you get it, you have to do again this uh, this one. <laughs> that power pose, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank congratulations, you. congratulations, congratulations. Congratulations. One last one, all right. So you guys, first uh, congratulations. And let me ask you, obviously, you know, how did you have this idea? Did you get tired of all this poor cell phone reception? Do you, are you a lot on the train? The idea, the idea came to us not during lunch, but during a coffee break. <laughs> we were discussing measurements with a colleague of us, and he made measurements from an, an airplane, and this shows that the uh, portions of the window are very... Um, um, the, the, how, how much uh, of the energy can get through the windows, but it's very dependent on the size of the windows. And so we can, came to the idea to work on the windows for the train. So we learned that you develop a pattern, but that sounds so easy. I mean, how, how do you know which pattern would work for that solution? Well, first of all, you start looking for what's there, what has already been done, and you learn quickly that nothing's out there which actually helps you. And you take, <laughs> you take what's there as a starting point, and you start to try. And then you keep trying and keep trying. <laughs> and get a feeling for what's going on, what, which parts of the pattern cause which effects. And, and then with this knowledge and this feeling you have, you, you get more and more closer to the solution you actually need. And once you're there, you're there. <laughs> And, and that really is the inventor's job, right? Dedication, keep, keep at trying. it, keep yeah. trying. So how important was this combined experiences for the three of you working together, this collaboration? Yes, uh, it was very important uh, because uh, every pe uh, person has uh, his own strengths and know-how. And uh, working together means uh, uh, bring uh, uh, a new uh, view to the problem from other sides and uh, to uh, look the, uh, at the problem uh, very systemic and uh, uh, you uh, can uh, collaborate at that way uh, the, best, the best way and uh, uh, so uh, uh, solve the problem uh, from all sides. Wow, really impressive. Thank you very much. I hope I get to experience this new invention next time I'm on the train. So best of luck for the future. Thank you and congratulations.
And uh, once again, also, please give a big round of applause to Sabrina Suzanne. Wow. Ingenuity, right? We have now heard about very complex solutions, difficult challenges, intelligent technologies. We have heard that it needs dedications. We have to keep trying and we need perseverance. It, it, it was all very inspiring, but sometimes it's the simple and the pure experience that really grabs our attention and touches us deep inside. Klimt is reduced soul. Her voice has been described as something that crawls into your ear and pulls out something that you normally don't show. The sound is a mixture of electronic sounds, soul, and spherical pop. Ladies and gentlemen, open your minds and ears for Klimt. <laughs> You keep saying what a mess I feel And I keep losing all the parts to me You keep saying more or less it's clear That I keep forgetting about what's best for me But you know sometimes I wanna be where all my demons lead me Sometimes I wanna see Where all these demons lead me to Cause you don't know About these crazy little fights And all those lonely, lonely nights I just ran into you don't fight about what's wrong and bad, what's right And all those lonely, lonely nights I just ran into I guess it's all, it's all, it's all Just a waste of time Sometimes I want to be where all my demons lead me Sometimes I want to see where all these demons lead me to Sometimes I want to be where all my demons can't find me And sometimes I want to see where all these demons lead me to So it's all just a waste of time, of time. Cause sometimes I want to be where all my demons lead me. Sometimes I want to see where all these demons lead me to. Sometimes I want to be where all my demons can't find me And sometimes I want to see where all these demons lead me to Thank you. Thank you very much. We're Klimt.
We're very happy to be here tonight. This is our next song. Don't try to act to interact to be interrupted by me. I just go for my goals and float with my flow. And you say it's not that easy to pretend you're happy like this, or you comfort them like this. But all I want. All I want, all I want is too much harmony in life. It's too much harmony in life. All I want, yeah, all I want is too much harmony in life. It's too much harmony. As the struggle goes on, I felt like at the very first beginning When you didn't say, hey, I just want to go for my goals and float with my thoughts Yeah, you shot to me, it's not that easy to pretend you're happy like this Are you comfort them like this? But all I want Yeah, all I want, all I want is too much harmony in life. It's too much harmony in life. All I want, all I want is too much harmony in life. It's too much harmony in life. All I want, yeah, all I want. It's too much harmony in life. It's too much harmony in life. Oh, don't you try to listen me? I'm in my real me. Movements. I'm the worst actor in this world. I wanna go for my goals and float with my flow. Oh, I'll go for my goals and float with my flow. I wanna go for my goals and float with my flow. Go for my goals and float with my flow. Go for my goals and flow with my flow. Thank you very much. Why do we do what we do? What drives us? Where do we get our motivation from? We all have the desire to create something meaningful, to make a difference, to find purpose in what we do. But what is purpose? What drives people to dedicate their lives to push the boundaries of what is possible? Well, everyone has a unique talent. And when we combine this unique talent with the service to others, we experience the excitement and fulfillment 
which provide the energy to create something unique and truly great that gives us purpose. And in this lies the ultimate answer to the question that all of us are asking, to realize that the purpose of life is a life of purpose. Now, our next speaker can be rightfully called an expert on purpose. She has been recognized as an entrepreneur to watch by Forbes 30 Under 30, Bloomberg, and Fast Company as the co-founder of Open Bionics, a robotics company turning children with limb differences into bionic superheroes. She's won the Global Robotics and AI for Good Award, the James Dyson Award for Innovative Engineering, and two British Engineering Excellence Awards. Her company works with businesses like Disney to turn science fiction into reality by building affordable assistive technologies that enhance the human body. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Samantha Payne. Hello, uh, thank you for having me this evening. Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about my company um, and our invention, which is hopefully fast becoming a marketplace innovation. Um, and so I, we're from Bristol in the UK, and this was the company that I founded when I was 23 years old. Um, and it's a company that sets out to create and democratize assistive technologies that enhance the human body. So any kind of robotic technology that can increase mobility, independence and quality of life. Um, we're really driven to reduce the price point of these devices and make them hyper accessible. Um, what we're also doing that's quite interesting is we're changing the narrative around what these devices look like and what they mean to their users. We turn disabilities into superpowers. And we're starting with the bionic hand. And this is for adults. I can get, yes. And for children, like uh, Logan. Um, I met Logan when he was 10 years old, um, and he was born without a hand. This device that he's wearing was the best that his hospital could give him. It's a cosmetic hand, it has no movement. And when you ask Logan what this device means to him, he, t he would tell you that actually it makes him feel more disabled. Um, when he wears this to school, he is... Uh, picked on and bullied um, for all the wrong reasons. And his story is the story of many limb-different children. And this follows them into adulthood, this stigmatization, it follows them, and it really has a huge impact on their psychology and their, their self-confidence. Um, and so we've been to the moon. Everyone in this room has a supercomputer in their pocket, um, and this is the best technology we could come up with for children without hands. Uh, as young, naive engineers, we thought we could do better, so we uh, reimagined the human hand. So we got together a group of young children who didn't have hands, and we asked them to draw what kind of hand they would like. So using any kind of technology, um, they have the room there for all sorts of hardware, what would they want? Not one child drew a hand that looked like a human hand. They drew hands that were their favorite color and had their favorite patterns. Um, they drew hands that could charge their smartphone, um, that had a smartwatch embedded rather than around the wrist. Um, one person drew a bionic hand with removable fingertips that housed USB sticks. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's, it's hardware. <laughs> um, so, we really enjoyed this process working with our users, and together we decided that we would turn children with limb differences into bionic superheroes. So we had this really big idea, um, but we're a very small team, and so we called up Disney and very nicely asked them if they would work with us. And the first time we did this, we got a no, because we went to the wrong people. Um, it was a process of perseverance and keeping asking and keeping pitch uh, pitching. And through their um, Techstars Accelerator program, we finally got the yes. And Disney were super supportive, they got their artists involved, and together um, we collaborated to reimagine these future bionic hands for kids. And so our first range of bionic hands for children include the official Iron Man bionic hand, the Disney Frozen bionic hand, 
and the Star Wars lightsaber bionic hand. Um, so these are not just pretty pictures. Um, the best part about this is that we actually built them. So Logan got his first multi-grip bionic hand. Uh, here, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's, it's green. It's like lit up green because he's in Yoda mode. <laughs> and on the next side, it's blue because he's Skywalker. And he can change the, the arm to glow purple and be Mace Windu. So he has all of these characters he can choose from. Um, he's literally embodying the superhero. He did ask if he could have Darth Vader, Darth Vader mode, uh, but Disney said that they didn't want any children on the dark side, <laughs> which is fair enough. <laughs> so we also decided to build the first Iron Man bionic hand, and this was for a young girl called Sydney. Here she is performing a very fine, dexterous task. She's using her thumb and finger for the first time. This kind of movement didn't exist for children. Uh, this was brand new. Um, and Logan, in the previous slides, were also, was also using his fingers in new ways, so the hands are pre-programmed to perform different actions. And just like Logan's device, Sydney's also has superhero powers. So just like Iron Man's official hand, she has LEDs that run up her arm that she can fire missiles from. <laughs> and she also has a repulsor blaster built into her palm so she can fire LEDs out, because that's really important. <laughs> um, so together with Disney, we released and shared with the world the world's first bionic superheroes, Avenger Sydney and Jedi Logan. This was a really, really big moment for us and the industry. It went viral overnight, and um, we had a huge reaction from the amputee community because they finally felt like they were being listened to as people rather than patients, and they were being designed with rather than designed for. Um, and it was, it was this huge outpouring, outpouring of support and, and excitement about what was next, what would we do next. The only negative feedback we had was from the adult amputee community. They were like, well, this is cool for the kids, but where's ours? <laughs> so we teamed up with uh, Idios Montreal, the creators of the award-winning video game DSX. Um, the really interesting thing about this uh, is that this video game exists in a science fiction universe where the augmented human is the celebrated human. Um, the people who are different are the best. Uh, Able-bodied people are less so, less cool, um, which is exactly what we wanted to play with. We wanted children to be able to run into school, run into the playground, and had something that made them feel super cool, um, be super empowering, be something that their friends couldn't have, um, and turn around something that they may have seen as a source of weakness into their greatest strengths. Um, we also wanted to play around with fashion. So we also designed the Titan arm, and this was our first attempt to design an arm that would look good on a catwalk, <laughs> theoretically. <laughs> so we also built these in real life. Um, this is Dan and Catherine. Both of these adults um, were children who were born without hands. And this was also the first time that either of them had ever had a bionic hand, because even for adults, whilst the technology does exist, it's super expensive. So for one hand, an adult would pay somewhere between £25,000 to £60,000. Using new 3D technologies, we've managed to reduce that price point to less than £10,000. And we also work with users who lose hands through traumatic amputation, like Tilly, who is a total superstar. Um, she lost both of her hands to meningitis when she was a baby, and she has been testing with us for two years. So she takes the devices home um, and really puts them to good use. Here she is uh, performing homework. She also uses the device to play board games and paint with her sisters. And she also uses the device to do really important things, like put her makeup on <laughs> and steal popcorn at the cinema. <laughs> so these devices um, are built to look super stylish, um, they're meant to be empowering and confidence boosting, but they are also robotic tools. These are robotic aids that we've built um, to help people, to enable them to live life easier. Um, it's been four years of um, really fast work, um, and I think 
the two biggest takeaways I have from this journey so far is how important the close relationship is with your users. Um, as engineers, it's quite tempting to, to play with the new technologies, to make a super advanced something, even when it's not necessary. Um, so I think it'd be really good for all engineers that are going out to solve a really big problem to spend a lot more time with their users, go and hang out with them, spend an entire day with them, go home with them, um, really dive into their life and, and really understand their problem inside and out. That way you can design a really good solution. Um, and the other final point I would make is that working with children really enabled us to think expansively. So when you have a lot of knowledge, you can be quite reductionist because you think you know everything. Uh, you think that you know where the limits of a certain technology are, is. Um, and so when we started, we were told constantly that 3D printing technology would never work for this application. No one would ever be able to build a, a 3D printed bionic hand and get it medically certified. The materials weren't robust enough. The materials weren't flexible enough. They would never be safe on skin. You would never get a really good finish. You could, um, people wouldn't like uh, bright pink, bionic hand or a bright purple glowy bionic hand. Um, so we were told a lot that this was never going to happen, um, but actually we launched the product this year. It's already the best-selling multi-grip bionic hand in the UK. We're launching in the US next year, um, and anything is possible, I think. So thank you very much for your time. Are you on this? <laughs> Thank you very much, Samantha, and to, to join us for a little talk on the stage, please welcome the Seaman's Chief Human Resources Officer and member of the Managing Board, Janina Kugel. Oh, she, oh there she is. Come from NASA. Welcome. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. Please have a seat. Sit here. Wow. Leaves you a little speechless, doesn't it? <laughs> now, Janina, we just heard from Samantha how employees at Open Bionics are really driven by purpose. And they have a lot of perseverance, which was obviously needed, but now you're successful and you're turning these disabilities into superpowers. We've seen the kids really uh, a great success story. So Janina, how does a company like Siemens with so many different employees and businesses motivate all of these employees to have that kind of purpose? Well, I mean, first of all, Samantha, I think this is really inspiring what you're doing and right, I mean, you're really making a huge contribution also to the life of children. And what we're driving to do is also to see that Technology, obviously, is the what, right? You know, what actually can, why can we do that? But the reason why we also try with our technology is that we also make really impact on society, on the life of human beings. Obviously not in the way that Samantha is actually doing that, but really giving a purpose to why are we inventing great new products and great technology. And do you think there is a difference uh, between the purpose that motivates people as individuals or the purpose for an organization? Well, I think, you know, an organization is only the sum of people, right? I mean, organization is nothing else than, than a lot of people. So you need to be driven by something because otherwise it's also no fun and definitely you're not going to invent something that, has, that no one ever did before if you're not really driven. So I think it's actually the same even though obviously the topics are different ones. Mm -hmm. And so most probably sometimes it's a little bit easier to do something for children um, than maybe to do something for adults or for, uh, to do for industry, but yes. I think it's the same. What do you think as an individual, but also as a COO? Um, I think that people are motivated by generally helping other people. Um, and so our team is a team of makers. It, everyone on the team is doing something that they're very passionate about anyway within their discipline. Um, and collaboration plays a big role in that. Getting to work with other people who are also very passionate about what they're doing. And all of these people who are makers and passionate and, and they want to change people's lives, um, they make the company. So the people are the company. The people are almost the product, really. And they put it together. So, Yadina, let me ask you a personal question. Obviously, you have a lot to do with people as a chief human resources officer. And what motivates, motivates you as an individual for your work? Actually, it's people. And I always say, I mean, you know, people is 
the best that can happen in a daily life, but it actually can also be pretty tough sometimes. <laughs> But, but the thing is, like, you know, coming together, having the passion, see that there is energy in the room and people that really want to create a difference, that's what motivates me. And tonight we talk a lot about inventions and also then hopefully innovations that become innovations. So, uh, in your opinion, what do you think drives innovation? I think it's, it, it's people that are driven and that have different thoughts, and I think you need to bring people with a lot of different ideas. We always call it the diversity of thinking, the diversity of experience, you know, someone having an idea of like, why are they actually striving for something? If you don't have that, and if you don't allow to bring all of those creative ideas together, I don't think that you can actually give, um, you know, come to room to actually invent something. And you need to give space, mm -hmm. and you need to be ready to also have failures, right? Because you're not going to invent anything new if you're not failing from some time to time. That's people, but also, in your case, technology. You showed us how you now actually built this arm whenever everybody said, well, that's not just not possible with printing technologies today. But, I mean, would your company even be possible, have been possible 10 years ago? Um, not, not in the same way at all, no. I think uh, what's interesting about my company is that we really rely on that social movement, actually, a, a, a cultural change. So now we celebrate diversity, we celebrate inclusion, um, whereas we didn't used to. And there's actually a big divide in our users. So adult, adults who are above like 40, 50 years old, they want the sort of the human look, they want to sort of blend in. Whereas the younger generation wants to stand out. So now we celebrate our uniqueness and individuality. It's a huge change, and it's something that we are capitalizing on. Yeah. I have a great quote here that I need to read. Uh, American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I know uh, some of you might know, once said, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. So, Janina, why do you think it's important to have purpose in work? Well, you know, even though I would actually say to be happy is also kind of yeah. like a relevant part of it, right? Being unhappy Could and be doing a side something effect. for purpose, <laughs> maybe. But the thing is, like, we're not getting up every morning to do something that no one actually cares about, right? We want to do something that helps other people. That is where you can see at the end of the day, or at least at the end of the week, that it was something meaningful. And, you know, in a company like ours, you know, a lot of people always, like, say motivation comes from getting a nice paycheck. Well, that helps for a while, but I can definitely tell you, whenever you ask people, they say, I want to make a contribution. And the paycheck is obviously something that you need, but that not. that's not what really matters. So it's purpose, even though it becomes kind of a fashy slogan word currently, but I still think it matters. Yeah. Let's step back uh, for once and just think about it. Finding purpose, it sounds like a noble idea, obviously. And it is maybe important for millennials, for young, idealistic people with maybe also few responsibilities. And not all of us are surgeons, firefighters, or inventors. How can, how can ordinary people really find their purpose? Uh, maybe both of you, Samantha, what do you think? I mean, you're that generation. Um, well, what I would say is that as a millennial um, and as sort of operating in the, in the startup scene for, for a while now is that millennials are looking for roles that have purpose built into them. Um, they're not really just looking from paycheck to paycheck. They, they're searching for a, a more meaningful experience. Um, and I think people find purpose by exploring and knowing more about themselves and what they love. So understanding your purpose comes from knowing what you love doing um, and practicing that. Um, so yeah, it will reveal itself once you once you are curious. And that includes you, right? I mean, you had quite a change in your career. You worked as a journalist before. How did you actually end up becoming the CEO of Open Bionics? I mean, did your career change have anything to do with with purpose that you were looking for in your life? Yeah, definitely. So I was so I was a tech tech journalist. Um, odd career change to bionic hands and robotics and a medical a medical company, um, but. I, I've always been interested in social impact, following stories where humans are impacted by technology in good ways. Um, and so when I met my co-founder, who's a robotics engineer, he had this idea to open source the human body. And it was very, it was a huge idea. Um, and I was totally bought into it and I wanted to help it happen, make, make it happen. So uh, we teamed up and it was the perfect combination and, and collision of skills. So, the advice about being diverse and seeking different skill sets and working with people who are from multi multiple disciplines, uh, who have 
different understanding experience from you was really important there. Um, so yeah, definitely driven from tech journalism to tech company by wanting to impact people's lives. So as a final question to both of you, three words, what drives you? My users, creativity and curiosity. Yanina? Um, people, challenges, and fun. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Samantha, for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and we will now just walk over to that stage. And, and we will get to our next award category, talents. Now, Albert Einstein famously said, I have no special talent. I'm just passionately curious. Well, as we know from Einstein and as we've seen and heard tonight, it takes more than mere talent to succeed in creating outstanding inventions. And when we talk about talent in this category, we talk about people who have managed to register a large number of inventions while only working for just a few years at Siemens. And with this award, we honor their enthusiasm for technology, their creativity, their determination that have earned them great respect from and attention among professional experts. And now? Well, you know, we spoke about motivation and what drives us. And I think the people that you're seeing today and the people that you're going to see are exactly those that are driven by something. They're driven by an invention, and they're driven by actually, you know, doing something better. And what they also need to be, they need to be persistent. Because as you already said, it's like, they are comparably young, maybe not as Samantha said, like the Gen Y, but still people that really want to do something. And the first winner in the category talent is Jean-Marie Martel. Um, he is from our Siemens Energy Management Division. And what he has invented with his team is electric a detection advice for device for electric arc. So what is an electric arc? An electric arc is when you have, it causes a lot of electrical fires when there's a fault in the system and things come together and then suddenly there's fire because for example, of a cable insulation that is damaged. And the important thing is that Jean-Marie um, has developed that in a first mass-produced ARC device, and that, of course, is very, very helpful. It was a niche product in the beginning, and the interesting part is now that it's actually mandatory in all of the buildings in Germany. And we expect that this is also going to happen all over the world. So really here, being early to the market, is something that then shows us that you can actually define the market, and then you can actually be the front runner of everything. What you need to know is that Jean-Marie is also an ultra-marathon runner, so something that currently I'm not actually able to do. And, you know, running an ultra-marathon, I cannot even imagine how that actually works. He says, you're just like dividing the entire race that you do in some slices, and then you achieve like every part one after the other. But what he also says, achieving what he and his team really achieved is definitely something that was a team effort. So please welcome with me, Jean-Marie, on stage. Congratulations. Congratulations. Let's get a nice picture of the two of you. So, Jean-Marie, let me ask you. Um, we just saw you running in that video, and obviously it was a long journey from the initial idea and invention to actually bringing it to the market. So what helped you stay motivated? 
Well, in your, in your question, it seems that you assume that I'm always motivated. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's almost true. Most of the time, yes. Um, actually, it's quite simple. I don't have really to look for, to find motivation. It comes alone from my work. Um, I like uh, to, to be in situations where I am, um, uh, um, uh, I would say, um, where I have to, to find new ideas. I just put me in the situation that I work in projects which are very challenging and uh, where we need to solve a lot of issues and in these conditions, and you must have ideas. No. And uh, I can you just give you an example of this situation when you, you start, I would say, you have a big issue and you, uh, you, you, you must find a solution quite quickly. Then I have maybe a first idea, a first intuition, then I will, uh, I will be very excited, I will have really a lot of adrenaline in this moment, then maybe I will go to the lab, make a test setup, and I feel maybe it will work, then share it with the team. And when you, you, you leave this, from the first intuition to maybe a finished solution, which is beautiful, then uh, you have a lot of, um, uh, um, you are just happy with this. You, it's something that I love in my work, and that always gives me new motivation for the next challenge. What are you doing when you're frustrated? Are you yeah. going for a run or? <laughs> when I'm frustrated. When you're frustrated. Running well, is always it, good. It happens too, yes. Sport, sports helps a lot. <laughs> so did you run ultra marathons already become, before becoming an inventor or? <laughs> oh, no, no, much after, since only a few years. No time. Yeah. So you just mentioned team. So, uh, and we talk a lot about collaboration tonight. Uh, how important is the team in creating an innovation? Well, it's it's not just important. It's absolutely necessary. Um, just if we speak about team, maybe you can help me doing this. So that I have a free hand. Then I, I can, can carry it. <laughs> thanks a lot. You give me it back later. It's not my arm. <laughs> With our teamwork, we designed oh, for wow. the Polawa new device which is this AFTD, a compact one, the new generation. And you said before, I am the inventor of this device. I did a lot of contributions, but it is definitely a teamwork. Now, you cannot realize such a device alone. There are contributions from our colleagues in the USA, from Atlanta. For the new design, we worked with our Chinese colleagues from Shanghai. And it's not about technical. There are a lot of aspects to, to consider. You need to manufacture it, it has to be cheaper, affordable, there are the quality aspects, financial of course, and we need a lot of people working together efficiently. So do you see any parallels between your hobby of running and keeping it going with the team and work? Well, uh, at the first glance I would say uh, parallels, uh, I mean running helps, <laughs> when I'm frustrated <laughs> maybe, uh, uh, during running I think a lot about a lot of things, also about the work. Uh, I have very often ideas during uh, running, but there is an interesting aspect, I think, uh, about this. Actually, running is not a team sport, no. But uh, when I run a trail uh, run in, in the mountain, um, for example, ultra run uh, in some desert places, you need, I would say, collaboration with other runners. Um, sometimes we can be very far from the, from the next station, it can be cold, it can be at night, and if something goes wrong, then you expect that the next runner will support you. I'm always ready to, to help the next one, to maybe share some food or water, and this is also what I expect when I work in a team at Siemens. We are a big company, but it is a company with a human face. To reach uh, the finisher line is important. To finish a project with success is a priority. But we need that people will finish healthy and happy and uh, motivated then for the next challenge. So keep running, keep inventing, and stay motivated. Thank you very much. And once again, congratulations. Thanks. I'll take that microphone. And I just wanted to let you know that we have an incredible number of people watching us online. 3,000 people are currently watching us in a live stream. So yeah, you can applaud them. Thank you, and keep watching.
And now we'll continue with the second award. Well, you know, the next inventor actually says that every project that he has been working on arises from an actual customer needs. And he says his inspiration are a lot of different sources, his family, his friends, his origins, and the fact that he's general curious. Ji Long Yao from Corporate Technology is a multi-talented inventor, and many of his innovations are report related to power supply. And what really motivates him is also what are the special needs of his home country, China. China is a need to really transmit a lot of power over a long distance. And therefore, China is also the country with the most HVDC lines. Um, that becomes a little bit technical. I would not be able to explain that for more than 60 seconds, but it's a very important part. And what Jiang did with his team, that he actually invented technologies and also devices that help to integrate HVDC into the grid. Um, and now that technology has actually reached an advanced stage of maturity, so it seems that you're kind of like getting bored. And that's why you said, okay, let's go on to the next, most exciting next topic, and that's the development of microinverters for robots. So his results actually show that for us, innovation power of our employees also lies very much in China, because you might actually remember that sometimes people said that Chinese products and Chinese technology were only actually invented for the Chinese market. But now, and this is one of the examples, they're actually invented for the entire world. So please welcome Jilong Yao. Please give a big round of applause to Jilong Yao. Congratulations. Yeah, you keep, you keep it going. Just a little more. Thank you. <laughs> All right. It just, it just helps with a smile. All right. So first off, congratulations. And let me ask you, how did you become an inventor and what motivates you in your work? Well, at the very beginning, I think I just wanted to be different and it was part of my job to invent. And as it goes on, then when, one of, when some of the inventions are really taken into a product, become a product or become a worldwide patent that gives a lot of excitement and I think that will make, that, that really make me continuously invent. And also because I have been work in city for 12 years, but in very many diverse areas, actually. So this also makes me continuously had to, had to do something new and to invent. And, as, and I think in the, in the end, if you need to go forward or to lead, you need to invent. And, and you did. So let me ask you, why? Did you become interested in robotics? Why that field of? Well, I wasn't get bored with the, the old era. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's say the robotics, I think it is a perfect area where the, the, the physical world and digitalization actually converge. And I really want to work together with uh, colleagues from different areas, from uh, control software, hardware. I'm from a physical uh, uh, background. I want to work together with them. And I believe the robotics are actually will change the world, and I really want to be part of it. You definitely are. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Thank you. Congratulations once again. <laughs> and now we'll get to the third award. Yeah. The answer is out there. It's the question that drives us. Now, some of you might wonder, what is she talking about? 
But those of you that know the movie Matrix might remember that line. I didn't remember that. Why am I talking about the movie Matrix? Because our next winner is a huge fan of that movie, Zuraj Muzavati. Matrix, the film, is a computer-generated program where human life comes together and they live in a dream, but they are designed to actually keep them under control. And one day, Suraj, that's what he says, he wants to create a software system that instantly turns the imagination of an inventor into reality. Just like in Matrix, but the inventors shouldn't actually lose their free will. So that's, I think, important. Originally, he's from Bangalore. Now he lives and works in corporate technology in Princeton. And there, he actually develops the algorithms for the future. Um, additive manufacturing, and I think you have heard about that, is transforming on how we are producing things. And using lattice structure allows us to create objects that actually have contradictory properties. So what I want to say with that is, for example, you can, an object can be extremely lightweighted, but it can support heavy loads. However, traditional software design programs were not really allowing to really model different structures to be used in additive manufacturing. And that's why he said, OK, why are we not developing advanced software tool capable of modeling and analyzing complex structures? Please welcome with me Suraj on stage. Congratulations. Congratulations. Great award. All right. And once again, keep it going for the picture. Thank you. Great. Woo. Really amazing. Congratulations. Now, let me ask you, now with that we can design shapes that are 100,000 times more complex um, and use the full potential of uh, additive manufacturing. Is there an everyday object that you would like to redesign? Yes, uh, I can think of uh, many, actually. So when I first got a low-cost 3D printer at home, my wife got really excited and she said, hey, can you make me a new vase with it? Can you make me a pencil holder? <laughs> can you make a keychain holder? And all sorts of things. 